Hello Blazers, welcome to episode 31 of UAB Green and Told, original air date Monday, October 26, 2020. Green and Told gives us the chance to share stories from members of the UAB community. I'm Greg Berry, Assistant Director in the UAB Office of Alumni Affairs. As Breast Cancer Awareness Month, October is pink. Today, we are talking with Shaquita Estes, a UAB graduate, nurse, and breast cancer survivor. As she will share, the world Shaquita knew was shattered a few years ago when she was diagnosed with cancer. In a span of mere months, her hair was gone, her reality changed. I I definitely didn't have any hair by Christmas. It went really fast. I mean, I, I lost everything. And through the ups and downs of what chemo had in store for her, she learned valuable lessons. We should never take life for granted. You know, I know every day we wake up, but do we really live in the moment? Are we present in the moment? But that's not all. She'll explain how an inquisitive kid led to another journey, one she never thought she'd take. I think it's always good to be able to have some open and honest conversation. And I feel like this book allow, allows us to have that open and honest conversation with our children. An energetic, outgoing woman who grew up dancing ballet, tap, and jazz, Shaquita Estes has plenty of creativity flowing inside her. Recently, she even co-authored a children's book, but we'll get to that in a bit. Before we get to that part of her story, we have to take a look at her journey, one that we pick up as a teenager looking to find a spot to study medicine. Really, how I landed up on UAB's campus was I wanted to go somewhere that wasn't too close for my mom, you know, to hop in her car and and just drive up on me, but not far enough, you know. I always wanted to go into the medical field. Ultimately, I wanted to be a pediatrician. And after doing my own research and, you know, testing the waters with a few things, I felt like they didn't have the relationship I wanted. So what best thing next would be the nurse. So I was looking for nursing schools here in Georgia. And at the time, we had just gone through the Olympics. And so Georgia State University did not have uh, dorms at the time. Um, They were actually hotels that they turned into dorms. So my mom was like, well, you'll have to stay at home. And I was like, "Mm, I don't want to stay at home. I want to experience the college life. So I started looking at other nursing schools and um, came across UAB. And we actually did like back way back in the day, they used to do like a senior tour or something. And my mom and I came down and I enjoyed it. I mean, it was, you know, two hours, two and a half hours from home. Growing up in middle school, I was bused from the south side of town up to the north side of town, which was called the um, Eminem program, which was minority um, for majority. And, you know, so I could, you know, be in a diverse environment and survive. So I thought, well, this will be a good environment, something new, something different. And then I can also have that campus life. You mentioned you always wanted to do something in the medical field, and especially with kids. Why? You know, I don't know. I always have had a love for children. Um, My girlfriends now always, you know, call me like mother hen. So I always had that motherly spirit. I used to be the neighborhood babysitter, always had an interest in children and protecting children. So That was what drove me to go into pediatrics. And then also when I was in Birmingham, I used to work at Children's um, Hospital. So um, that was really cool too. So I got the experience of working there. And then when I moved back home, I worked at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta after getting my nursing degree. To put things in perspective, this was the mid nineties when you were in Birmingham going to UAB. What was UAB like during that time? I think it was still coming up on the map. It wasn't, it was known, but it wasn't quite at its peak yet. So um, communities were still very small and we had, you know, it, it, it almost was kind of family oriented. You, you found a family or a group and you kind of hung together. And it was, you know, safe. I, I felt good about it. It was a good learning environment. You know, all the things that I was looking for in a college with, you know, having a social life, but also having my educational um, and then with some of the top hospitals right there surrounding it, it, it just worked for me. You've been in the medical 
field, the healthcare field for more than 20 years. What was that first stop like after you left UAB? You know, to be honest, I was a little nervous coming back home, you know, after being in Birmingham for four years. I, I think I was ready um, to spread my wings and really get into my nursing career. I think I got a great experience, a well-rounded nursing experience um, before I ventured off into some other things. And you did venture off. I mean, you've done hospital care, you've done home health, primary care, and now you're in pediatric dermatology. How has UAB helped shape the course of your journey? I think it was actually a foundation, a good foundation, a good stumping ground for beginning nursing and having experience worked at the VA with uh, adults. And I knew I did not want to work with adults. And then having that experience at working at children's. I feel like it was, you know, the, the professors were right on spot, but I felt like the, if you had a good foundation, then you could, you know, pick up and go. You spent a career and you still are spending a career helping others. But in 2018, something happened to you that basically stopped you flat and you're diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer. Yeah. Talk a little bit about just when you received the news, the emotions that you had. Yeah, it's very hard shifting from the healthcare provider now to the patient. Um, and I don't know uh, if you would agree with that, but I always find it hard for healthcare professionals to be taken care of. You're so used to doing the nurturing and taking care of and planning and all of that, that now um, it's the shoe is on the other foot. So emotionally, it was every, all my emotions were everywhere. You know, um, you, I just would have never expected it in a million years that it would be me or me to be diagnosed with something as serious as cancer. Um, especially somebody who was in healthcare, who worked out, who tried to eat as, you know, good as possible. Um, you know, I was going to the gym three times a week, um, working out early at 5.30 in the morning and still it happened. So I went through that phase of why me, God? Like, why me? Why, why do I deserve this, you know? And then I had to realize that I was being called upon uh, an assignment is what I always call it now, that God was calling me for an assignment. And in this assignment, I was to share my journey because ultimately it's not about me, but it's about who comes behind me, the women, the mothers who come behind me and the families that are going to experience this. And so I, emotionally, I was just torn apart. I, I really was. And again, it's just like, now how am I going to still be able to be a healthcare provider and still go through now with this disease process? At the time, your daughter was seven years old. Mm -hmm. As a seven-year-old, it's really tough to comprehend what mom is going through. Right. What were the conversations like with her to comfort her and get her through that initial journey? I think a lot of time was reassurance, you know, letting her know that mommy is fighting, that we are all going to be on this fight together, um, that you know, you and your brother won't be left alone at any point. And then in the midst of that, I was reassuring myself, you know, crying behind closed doors, but coming out with that strong face. I think as a mother, parent, um, you know, we waited a month into my diagnosis. Once we had our my care plan together, um, we knew the doctors, tests had been done, everything literally to the T. Um, right before I was going to start chemo, um, before we shared with our children. And then one day we set them down in that October and we said, you know, this is what mommy has been diagnosed with. And just keeping it in very layman terms for them, you know, easy going. Um, and she had some signs of regression. Um, she wanted to sleep with us again, you know, wanted to be coddled. Um, always up under me, you know, so those things not only helped her, but it also helped me too. 
So it was just a lot of spending time and being creative on how we were going to spend time together, um, considering all the things that were about to happen and, and did happen through this journey. We started to look for resources, okay? And so out of the resources that I found, there were very few that were African-American books that she could actually relate to. You know, we, we found very few things like that, you know? And so I was like, why, why, why don't we have those type of resources, right? Because cancer knows no name. It affects every race and ethnicity. So we should have books of color that everybody can be represented and feel like they're being uh, taken care of or have resources to, to lean on. So after talking to her one day, she came home and she was just regurgitating, you know, things that happened, you know, time frames of things. And I said, oh my, you know, I didn't realize that my journey was truly a part of her journey as well and that she was remembering things just as I was remembering things. And so I said, you know, we should, we should write a book. And she said, yeah, we should. And so that's how our book came about. We wrote the No Hair, Don't Care book. And we just started writing a manuscript basically off of her feelings from, the, from her, her point of view, her eyes as to how this journey really happened. And of course, this is only a piece of the journey, but this was one piece of our journey that really affected us both was losing my hair for me and the appearance of, you know, people talking about her mom for her. Here she is, seven years old. She's already coping with you going through cancer. You have her write her thoughts down. What was the process like with her? The, the journey of just putting crayon to paper, pencil to paper, pen to paper, whatever it may have been. Yeah, I think it was exciting really to see her formulate her ideas and um, come up with you know, the story with me. Because again, that just goes to show you how you are being, you know, modeled for your child, you know, being a role model. And she was seeing me every day get up, you know, do my hair, put on my makeup, you know, all of those things. And she was able to, you know, articulate that to me. So I just found it, you know, um, very exciting that here we are, we never in our million dreams talked about being authors. We never, I mean, that just was not on my, you know, <laughs> my board to do, but I figured why not turn something so traumatic into something that could be very triumphant for others. And I felt like other mothers needed that, you know, um, because that's a big part of chemo is losing your hair and, you know, losing your self identity or your, um, your image that you have of yourself and then realizing that you're still beautiful. You're still a beautiful person inside and out. As long as you're walking humbly and gracefully in it, you know, the journey will be what it is and what it's meant to be. And you can help so many other people behind you by just sharing a simple piece of, of your journey. And the journey through the book was actually written through Lexi's eyes and she's the main character right you went that way intentionally through her eyes why i think it was important because i mean we need to hear from our kids we need to hear what they're going through and i and i think it's good for every age it's a cute heartfelt book but i think that that was the way we could capture more parents to listen in to say you know, here's a child who's saying how she feels, how she pictures things to happen, what she's seeing her mom do each and every day. And they never probably thought about it, that a child could, you know, really express themselves on how they feel. You know, they're little people too. So I thought that it was a great idea to share the book through her eyes and capture her story and what she's really feeling, you know, during this time. Um, because they're watching you go through it each and every day. And sometimes we're not able as the patient to express, you know, how we're necessarily feeling, but she was able to see days where I didn't feel good or I felt great um, to the point where we started some normal routine again. Did you see a change in her throughout this process of writing the book and how she approached you? I think so. 
know. I think, you know, we got closer, we bonded, you know, it was more of like, what do you think, let's see, how do you think, what picture should we put here? So I think, you know, it was almost like she grew up, you know, in a time frame. And she became stronger too. You know, I think, you know, looking at her and my son, I always often wonder, you know, what do they think about their mom? You know, do would they say to someone later in life, you know, my mom was a real fighter. She was a warrior. She, you know, did X, Y, and Z. And, and, I, and it still worked, you know? So I think that speaks for itself that I still was working during this entire process. And that's, that, that wasn't easy, you know, to still go to work, um, having, you know, chemo just a couple of days before, um, and not really being able to express that to your coworkers or have people share in it and ask you questions and things of that nature, you know? So I did see some growth, some maturity in her through the book and the time we finished. And then we were so excited to share it. You know, we, oh, we, um, opened it up to the public on February 11, 2000 uh, of this year. And that's on her birthday. That was her ninth birthday. So we released the book uh, on her ninth birthday, which I thought was very special. Um, another year of growth. And then you have this to always remember that on your ninth birthday, we did this special thing. She showed growth. Did you see your perspective change during this process with her as well? Oh, absolutely. Um, I, I mean, I think through the entire journey and still walking through the journey is that we should never take life for granted. You know, I know every day we wake up, but do we really live in the moment? Are we present in the moment? And um, I had to take a more conscious attitude of being present and enjoying and finding something to smile and laugh about each day because we don't know what day is promised. And so I definitely saw growth in myself and strength that I never knew I had. I mean, I always have been a strong woman and strong mind and strong will, but you really do pull from the depths of your feet, your soul all the way up to really accomplish a lot of things when you're going through the cancer journey. You mentioned that the book was released February 11th, 2020. What was the reception like when it was released? Oh gosh, we had we have had such great reception. I, I mean, we've sold over 500 books on our own, just off our, our own webpage, not to mention what's been selling on Amazon. Um, I've been trying to reach out to, you know, breast cancer foundations and different things like that. Um, really hoping that someone would pick it up as a resource. So we've Got the book in two um, Black-owned bookstores here in Georgia, um, which has been phenomenal. And so I'm working with some other out-of-state bookstores now as well, trying to get the book in there. But I mean, people have just numerous, oh, we're so proud of you and Lexi. Um, you know, the book touches um, home for me. You know, I remember when my parent had cancer and, you know, I wish this was around or, you know, other mothers who survivors that have gone through breast cancer and um, now are, you know, moving on. They're excited about the book. So really, really good, warm reception, which makes me want to write another one now. My oncologist um, buys books from me and shares with, you know, newly diagnosed breast cancer. So Again, I feel like I'm definitely walking in my purpose and, you know, this is what God has called me to do and I'm excited about the journey. It has to be a humbling experience to have your doctor um, ask you to get some books for her um, as well as the other moms coming up to you and say, this was such a great resource for yeah. me. It's got to be a sense of pride for you. I never thought it was going to be this, you know, I started with, we started with a little idea and then it just blossomed and blossomed and blossomed. And I felt like, you know, we have, and even if you don't have breast cancer, I tell people all the time, if you're going through a journey, hard time, any type of illness, I think it's always good to be able to have some open and honest conversation. And I feel like this book allow, allows us to have that open and honest conversation with our children about what is about to take place when you go through chemo or a loved one goes through chemo. You really had no idea what writing a book entailed at the time, did you? Oh God, no. <laughs> not at all, not at all. It, 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 it was a long six months. Um, we just did a literacy 
program for elementary school yesterday. And it, it, it was a process. And um, towards the end, it got it got a bit frustrating because I was ready to go and move with things and it just wasn't happening. And going to treatments and things like that, it just, things were not aligning. And I was just like, oh my God, we worked so hard um, to get this book done, but it can be done. It really can be done. Um, and if you're not a perfectionist, then it, you know, it probably could get done quicker. But I enjoy the process really and truly. And now I even feel more comfortable writing another or self-publishing another children's book because now you know what it takes um, to do that. What would that sequel or what would that next book be? One other thing that I experienced a lot of was neuropathy during chemo. I think that's always a good thing because people don't really understand when you talk about neuropathy, what that really feels like. And it's really hard to tell people. So I think that would be a great idea or even something on health and nutrition because, you know, a lot of times cancer patients want to go to either a keto or plant-based diet, become vegan or vegetarian. And so um, another thing is exercise. So I think exercise and eating healthy could be a, another sequel to this book um, or um, you know, something along the lines with explaining how neuropathy plays a part and how exercise is good, um, you know, to work through some of that. Would you collaborate with Lexi on that one too? I don't know. I would like to. I would like to keep some of these because she's been exercising with me. Sometimes I drag her out the walk with me. Um, but I would like to keep the characters to be in sync with this one um, and maybe do another two books on something different. Yeah, my, my oncologist is definitely, she's like, let's go, let's get the next book. <laughs> I was like, give me time, give me time. <laughs> I, I think in, in listening to you, you told your children in October of 2018 that you had cancer, right? So you were diagnosed in September? Yes. When did you start chemo? I started chemo probably at the end of October, 1st of November. When did you start losing your hair? Between the second and third treatment. So it wasn't long. So probably, I, I definitely didn't have any hair by Christmas. It went really fast. Um, and so I had hair that was down my shoulders. I mean, I, I lost everything. How hard was that to reach up, touch your head and not have anything there? You know, at first it was it was very hard for me. I remember going to work one day between the second and um, third treatments. I had just had my hair blown out. It was very long, and I noticed all this hair on my my coat. We wear white lab coats, and um, one of my nurse techs says, "Man, your hair is just God. I keep seeing all this hair in your coat." And I went in my office and took my coat off, and sure enough, I just my hair was shedding and. You know, one of my best friends said, Shaquita, we will control the things we can control, but the things you can't control, don't worry about. And so from there, I just decided to set up a hair appointment. Um, my best friend and my, my sister, and I call her my sister in love, we all went to the beauty um, salon before anybody came. And uh, my beautician just, she tried to save it but she couldn't and she just shaved it all off. You know, they allowed me that moment to cry and then I put on my big girl panties and I said, okay, we're gonna do this. And it was a very liberating experience to be quite honest. I mean, I felt like pressure was released from me because we put a lot, you know, women, we put a lot of emphasis on our hair and it's our crown and, and you know, it's just our glory. And to, to lose all of that, to, for that to be taken away, not by choice, was very devastating to me because I was like, how are people going to look at me? You know, my hair is me. And then I said, no, you just have to walk very boldly, bodaciously and beautifully in who you're called to be. And don't worry about hair. And that's what I used to tell Lexi. You know, she, she used to say, well, what if people talk about you? And I said, baby, don't worry about what people say. We won't worry about what people say. Mommy can handle that the most important thing is that we understand what's going on and that we love each other. And with or with no hair, you know, with or without the hair, I'm still your mom and I still love you. Where are you at right now with your cancer? I am no evidence of disease. Um, praise God for that. 
I'm still receiving chemo right now um, every three weeks. I'm not, you know, quite ready to be off, according to my doctor. So um, that's where we are. So it's just a part of a part of treatment now, and we'll move forward. Hopefully, some clinical trials and new studies will come up for triple negative um, breast cancer patients and. Um, I will continue to do what I'm doing, exercising, working out, and you know, doing my part so that I can stay as healthy as possible. That's Shaquita Estes, a pediatric nurse at Emory University. In 1997, she earned her BSN from the UAB School of Nursing. In more than two decades of working in health care, Shaquita has worked in hospital care, home health, primary care, and now pediatric dermatology. As a mother of two, including her co-author daughter, Shaquita has an idea of what it means to be a blazer. I think for me to be a blazer, how can you blaze high? Like I think of that dragon and the fire coming out and me being that that person with a lot of fire, you know, um, and, and strength and and just carrying on and, and reaching levels that you may have never thought you were going to reach, but you just steadily climb to be that blazing blazer. Our podcast is growing, but we would love to have you share our stories with the UAB community. Like, retweet, and comment on our posts on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We can be found at UAB Alumni. Listen to past episodes of UAB Green and Told on iTunes, Spotify, and Stitcher. While there, leave a review. You can also find it at alumni.uab.edu slash greenandtold. Know someone who has a story to tell? Email me at greenandtold at uab.edu. Thanks for listening, and until next time, go Blazers!